I'll be back up teaching next weekend. I'm going to be talking about communication with our families. Anybody ever had a breakdown in communication with your family? Can I get a mm mm-hmm from anybody in the room? It is going to be a great week. I'm looking forward to being back teaching. But we started this series off. I talked about honesty in communication. Honesty in FaceTime with one another and with God. It's the foundation to communication, to conversation. Last week, Ed Delft talked about how God can take a moment from the Bible, a verse from the Bible, and make it absolutely real for whatever decision you're trying to make today. And today, Paul Covert, who heads up all of our prayer strategies here on our campus and to churches around the valley that God's connecting us with, Paul Covert, our prayer pastor, is going to be talking about how we communicate with God, our relationship with him, and standing in the authority that he's given us. And what I want you to know about this man right here is some of you don't know this, um, Paul was the one who hired me into ministry for the first time. He was the first senior pastor, him and his wife Annie, who took a risk on a young punk kid and said, you know what, I think maybe Jesus lives in that guy's heart and gave me the opportunity to serve in ministry. He and Annie, yes, give God a big hand for that. And I've got some great he's, stories. He's got some stories which he's going to keep between him and Jesus. Okay, <laughs> so, and then he and Annie stood by my side in one of the most painful times of my life. And uh, one of the main reasons I'm still in ministry today is because of God's love for me and how he loved me through Paul and Annie. And they just stood with me. So I am so honored. Annie, would you do me a favor? Would you just stand real quick? Come on, girl. Just give Annie a big hand. So I love him so much. He's one of the most humble men I know. And matter of fact, he's gone through so much physically in his life. I can't get into all of it today. Someday I will share maybe some more of his story that he's gone through physically. But even this week, uh, he had an outpatient procedure to get his heart was out of rhythm. And they had to put a trach into his throat. And they went in and, and got his heart moving in the right direction. And I thought just working with me might have knocked it out of alignment. So I'm going to apologize for that. But um, I just want you to give a big hand for my friend Paul Covert today. Thank you, man. Thank you. <laughs> You know, we've been out Pure Heart now about, uh, uh, about a year and a half. Dan approached me about joining the staff, and we've actually been on staff for about 10 months. And i got to tell you, we are loving it. We're enjoying the staff. We're enjoying the church. And we, we're enjoying you. This is a great place to be. And I believe the very best days for Pure Heart are still to come, don't you? I believe God's, God's got some incredible stuff he wants to do. And uh, I think it begins, at least in part, in prayer. And I want to say to you this morning that prayer is an incredible adventure, maybe one of the most incredible adventures that we ever get the privilege of being a part of. And I know that for, by now you've realized that prayer is not some cosmic vending machine where you put a prayer in and you pull a handle and out pops your answer, right? How many of you have ever prayed a prayer and it didn't work the way you wanted to? Let me see your hands. Look around you. I mean, we all have, right? It, it, it's natural. And, and as I begin this message, as we talk about prayer, I want to try to help us understand and give some insight to some of those, those things. First of all, I would say that sometimes the prayer we're praying, God doesn't answer because he has something bigger or better for us. Have you ever prayed for something and you thought, this is exactly what I want and this is exactly what I need, and it doesn't happen? And then a month later or two months later or three months later, you know, God does something that just out of the blue, and you go, oh, I get it now. God had something better for me. And so because we can't see it all, because we, we can't uh, see the future, sometimes when God holds back on something, it's not because he's a miserly God. It's because he wants to give you something so much better. Sometimes uh, we have this expectation of what prayer is going to look like. I'm good at this. I, I, I sit back and pray and think, okay, I'm going to pray about this, and this is what my answer is going to look like. And, and sometimes my answer doesn't look anything like what I prayed about. Anybody relate to that? You know, so when I think about just a simple illustration of, let's say I need a car. So I begin to pray, God, I, I need a car, I need transportation, and I'm a guy, so let, let's talk about, God, something like a brand new Corvette. Any, any brothers in the house, brand new Corvette? I mean, that makes sense to me, right? And so I'm praying, God, I, I, need a, I need a car, and, you know, a brand-new Corvette would be awesome. And what I get is a bus pass. <laughs> and I'm thinking, God, 
you know, Corvette, bus pass, you know, what, what's up with this? And, and what I begin to realize is that my need was transportation. My expectation, first of all, I couldn't afford the payments on a brand new Corvette. Second of all, I couldn't afford the insurance. And God gave me exactly what I needed. My expectations were out of line. You see, prayer in some ways, there's mystery about it. Always has been, always will be. And I praise God for that. Because I don't want to serve a God I can figure out and I can see everything he's doing. I want to serve an omnipotent God who's doing exactly what he wants to do in his kingdom and for us and for me and you. Now, occasionally, Satan tries to, to give us some misconceptions about prayer. And sometimes he's successful. I was speaking uh, not too long ago in a women's gathering and doing a Bible study on prayer. And I gave my study and we had a great time. And afterwards I asked, does anybody have any questions? And some gals raised their hands and I tried to answer those questions. And the very last gal who raised her hand, raised her hand really timidly. And she said, I don't ever pray. I said, what? She said, yeah, I, I, I don't ever pray. And I said, why? And she said, because I'm afraid I'll get it wrong. It just broke my heart. She's afraid to pray because she's afraid she might do something wrong. And Satan had deceived her into thinking that it was better not to pray and that God would be critical of her prayers. I prayed with a man, and he was saying to me, you know, I struggle with prayer because I pray ugly. I looked at him a little closer, and it didn't look ugly to me. But he was talking about his words. He just didn't feel like his words were the way he wanted them to come out. And he said, I feel like I pray ugly. And so I spent some time with him explaining to him that God's not interested in your words. He only cares about your heart. That's what matters to him. Maybe the best way I can illustrate what I'm trying to say is with a, a video. It's a, it's a video of my grandson, Owen, who's seven and a half months old, and my oldest son, Ben, and uh, they're communicating with each other. Watch this. Oh, that's a great story. Tell me the rest. Oh, yes. And then what? That's it? Pretty cute kid, wouldn't you say? Yeah. <clears throat> Did you notice my son Ben when he was when Owen was trying to communicate with him, he didn't say to him, now, Owen, I want complete sentences when you talk to me. <laughs> or he didn't say, your diction isn't very good. I want you to be speaking more clearly when you speak to me. He didn't say that. He was thrilled that his son was communicating with him. It, it, you can tell it made his week. And that's just a fraction of what it's like when you communicate with God. I get this picture that when you pray, God's sitting in heaven, and he's sitting on his throne, and you start praying, and he leans his ear down like this. Now, God's not hard of hearing. Don't misunderstand me. But he leaves his ear down, goes like this, and he listens. Because he loves you so much, and he's thrilled that you want to talk to him. You see, I don't believe it's possible to pray ugly I don't believe it's possible to pray wrong. Is there an amen in the house? Amen. I, I just don't believe that's possible, okay? Now, what I want to talk about is uh, once we begin to pray, I've been learning about a, a next step. And it, it's, it's, it's a step where I begin to pray in some of the authorities I've been given as a believer, okay? That's what I want to teach you today is how to begin to pray in some of the authorities you've been given as a believer in Christ. Now, let me be very clear Please don't miss this, okay? God hears your prayers however you pray them, okay? You can't pray wrong. But what happens when we pray in the authorities we've been given is that we have more boldness. We have more confidence. It's like pouring rocket fuel on our prayers because we're praying in the authority that God has given us as sons and daughters of the king. Now, Praying as a child is the, the authority I want to begin with. And uh, you might think, well, praying as a child, that, that's not a big deal. Oh, yeah, it is. 
Have you ever thought about the royals, the England royals, and those little kids of Prince William and Kate? You think those kids are not special kids and treated specially? You see, we are kids of the king. And, and child, this relationship with it as a child is a very special relationship. Every now and then, Annie and I raised three boys. She did more of it than I did for sure, but we raised three boys. And every now and then, I'll write them a text or an email. And when I finish that email, I get to sign my name, Dad. And every time I do that, it, it does something to my heart. My, I throw my shoulders back a little bit, and I, I go, yeah. There's something about those kids. They're my sons. They're our sons. They, they're just, it's a special, lifelong relationship. It's an intimate relationship. I was in Israel several years ago on a prayer journey. We were praying over the nation of Israel and some of the missionaries there. There's a, a slide that's going to come up behind me as I'm talking about this, but I was sitting on public transportation, and there was a, a guy, uh, uh, an Orthodox Jew, with a, you know, a black hat and the real long sideburns that come down to about here, and you know, the white shirt, and his son he was about four or five, six years old, something like that, and they were talking back and forth in Hebrew, and I'm kind of looking at them, of course their culture is different than mine, and not staring, but you know, just looking at what's going on. And they were talking in Hebrew and talking back and forth and talking back and forth. I couldn't understand a word they were saying, and I basically tuned them out. But every now and then, the little boy would say a word I recognized. You know what it was? Abba, which is the Hebrew word for daddy. And he was saying to his father, daddy. It was an intimate relationship between father and son. And it's a positional relationship. A son and daughter, a son or a daughter is entitled to the parent's possessions when they're deceased, generally, great or small. And Jesus died on the cross, friends, so that you and I could be heirs with him in Christ Jesus. Uh, we have the opportunity to become sons and daughters of God. And when you think about that, it's kind of mind-blowing. When, when you realize that you're a joint heir with Jesus, you ever, you ever pondered that? Everything that Jesus inherited, we have the chance to inherit as well? It blows my mind. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, Paul, that, that sounds great, but when I, when I think about the word father, I grew up in a really dysfunctional home, and, and there's nothing about the word father that draws me towards God. It, it, it just doesn't. And I want to say to you that I'm not talking about a flawed human father here. I'm talking about a relationship with a perfect, loving, heavenly Father that will never leave you or forsake you. The Bible tells me, and it tells you, that nothing can separate you as a son or daughter from the love of God, neither height, nor depth, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things past. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. There's a verse I want us to look at, and it talks about this position that we have the opportunity to walk in, which is the, the sonship or daughtership of the king. It's Romans chapter 8 and verse 14, and here's what it says. For those of you who are led by the Spirit of God are, what's it say? Okay, say that stronger for me. Say it again. Children of God. It, 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 this is not conjecture. This is the word of God. This is the truth. You are a child of God if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior. Then it goes on to say, verse 15, the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, by the blood of Jesus, by his sacrifice, we are able to cry out, Abba, Father. Now here's the fact. The fact is, you're a prince or you're a princess in the kingdom. Now, I know some of you gals, I don't know about you guys, but some of you gals always want or have always wanted to be a princess. Well, here it is. You are. You're a princess in the kingdom of God. Fellas, you're a prince in the kingdom of God. And Satan is the one who wants to steal this truth from us because he knows how dangerous it is, how dangerous it is. 
He wants to steal this truth away from us by saying things like, oh, you don't deserve to be a prince or a princess in the kingdom. You remember what you did last week? You remember what you did two weeks ago? And you think you're a prince or a princess in the kingdom? You see, because he knows how powerful this truth is, he'll do everything he can to discourage you and to keep you from exercising the authority that you've been given as a right by Jesus Christ. And your confidence can soar in prayer and your faith can skyrocket in prayer. Not because you're special, but because of what Jesus did for you and because of the unlimited resources of the power of God. Now, when I was in college, well, let me back up a little. When I was in high school, my dad was a farmer. And uh, we had a little farm and we worked on the farm. But when I went off to college, he opened a jewelry store. Now, when I say jewelry store, you're probably thinking of some fancy, dancy kind of place. That's not what we're talking about here. So back that truck up, okay? We're not talking about that. It was kind of like a barber shop that had a little bit of jewelry in it. And I can remember when I would go home to see my folks, <clears throat> a lot of times I'd have to go to the store because they'd be working in the store. And so I'd go into the store, and first thing I'd do is I would greet the help. And you're probably thinking, well, there's six or eight people working behind it. No, it was just my aunt, and she worked part-time. And so I'd say hello to her, and then I'd step behind the counter. There's a little door, and I'd step behind it, and I'd go straight to the break room. And I'd go into the break room and open the refrigerator, and because I was a college kid, I was always looking to see if there was any food in the refrigerator. And then I'd drink a Coke, and sometimes I'd take a nap on the break room couch. And if I got bored, sometimes I would take the keys to the showcases and open up a showcase and pull out the jewelry and look at it and hold it up and look at the watches. And I, I just did whatever I wanted to do in the store. Now, can you imagine if I went to Jared's this afternoon and just decided I was going to march behind the counter? Or what if I went to E.D. Marshall's over in Scottsdale and decided I was going to go behind the counter? Well, they'd haul me off. But you see, I could do that because my dad owned the store. That's what I'm trying to tell you here. You have way more authority and position than, than many of us ever use. You can go behind the counter. You can step into that place because of who God is and because of how much he loves you. Now, not too long ago, uh, I had a my dad had a problem. He's 86 now. And occasionally when he has a difficult problem, I'll step in and help him with it. And so he talked to me and I got involved in this problem. And honestly, it was a humongous problem. It had, had layers to it. And in, in the natural, I thought, man, there's just no way that this is going to get resolved. I, I'm like 99.9% .9 sure that this is going to get ugly. It's going to take a long time to resolve, and man, I, just, I don't know what to do with this. But in the, in the spirit, I thought, you know, God takes care of me. I'm his son. And so I thought, I'm going to step into this role. Remember, I'm learning this idea of stepping into the roles that I've been given. And so I thought, I'm, I'm going to step into this role, and I'm going to pray as a child. And so I prayed just a, a simple prayer like this. God, I'm a child of yours, and you know this problem is bigger than I am. It's bigger than my insight and my wisdom. But it's not too large for you. And so I place this problem into your hands. And I ask you to take care of it for me. By faith, I'm walking in my role as a child and trusting you to help me. And you know, within a, it, within a couple of months, really right down to the 11th hour, God resolved this problem for us. It not only resolved the surface problem, but all the layers of the problem as well. To my shame, I got to tell you, I was astounded. I was like, I can't believe this. And then I remembered I'd placed this in his hands and allowed him to take the problem. Now, sometimes when I'm teaching, I, 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 I like to display the opposite of what I'm teaching. And that's what I want to do in this second point. I want to talk about the contrast of praying and the authorities we've, we've been given. And I call that uh, praying in anxiety. Praying in, praying in anxiety. If we're praying in anxiety, we're not praying in the, the role that we've been given by God as a son or a daughter. We're praying out of stress. We're praying out of desperation. Look again at that passage that we talked about earlier, Romans chapter 8, verses 14 and 15. I wanted to read, I want to read it again because here's, 
what it says. It says, for those of you who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. We've established that. We've got that. But notice verse 15. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves. In other words, you don't have to be in anxiety. You don't have to be in stress so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption of sonship. It's almost like God is saying, look, let me have it. You don't have to live this way. Now, I'm not being critical. I want to be clear. I pray out of anxiety sometimes. I pray out of desperation sometimes. All I'm saying is there's a better way. And we sometimes have this crazy misconception that God is this cosmic miser. He wants to keep us from having good things. And that's just not true. God loves you. He can't wait to bless you. And all we need to do many times is just come to him and place them place things at his feet. Notice what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 is in verse 14. He says, if you then, he's, t- he's speaking to us as parents. And he says, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? You see, God is not a cosmic miser. You don't have to beg to get his attention. You don't have to beg to demonstrate sincerity. So how do we do this? How do you walk in this place of authority? Well, let me share just some quick thoughts on that. I, I played football, and, and what I'm going to say here is the first step is you've got to walk in this truth. You've got to walk in the truth that you are a son and daughter of the king. I played football in the Holy Land. You may not have realized that the Holy Land has a pretty robust football program, but I played football in the Holy Land. That's right. I played football in Lincoln, Nebraska. Yeah, go Huskers. There's a sister right there. Yeah. And so one of the things you don't realize is that there's no basketball, pro basketball team in Nebraska. There, there's no baseball team, pro baseball team. The only thing that's going on is, is football in Nebraska. And so beginning in junior high, those of us who played football, we, we learned 25 plays. The 54 trap, the 54 dive. The 34 trap, the 34 dive. The 54 pass, the 34 pass. We learned those plays. And you started learning them in junior high. By by the time I was a freshman, I could run those plays in my sleep. I mean, I owned those things. I knew exactly, I didn't have to think about who, who was my responsibility, who I needed to block. I knew exactly where to go because I'd run those plays thousands and thousands of times. Now, I'm going to share something with you. I, I really need some counseling when it, when it comes to this whole football thing. And if there's a counselor in the house, I want you to, when this is over, I want you to come down here because I, I, I definitely need some help, okay? And this is painful, okay? So walk with me here and, and be gentle with me. But when I play football, as I said, you're probably looking at me, if you look at me closely, you probably think I was a wide receiver or safety, right? That's a joke. There's a few of you who got it. Most of you didn't get that. Yeah, I was on the line. You bet. I was the nose man on defense, and I was the tight end. And my nickname in high school was Stone Hands. And the reason for that is because I couldn't catch a ball to save my soul. As a matter of fact, and here's where the therapy comes in, and please don't laugh too hard because this is very painful, okay? But I can still hear it in my mind. I, I, I would be, every time there was a blocking play I was in, but I, I could hear the quarterback call 54 trap pass, and I'd think, ooh, here's my chance, you know? And then I would hear the coach on the other side of the field yell, hollering, it's a pass, get stone hands out of there. Swenson, you're in, he can't catch. And they'd take me out every single time. And, and I, just, I just needed therapy. I still do because it's so painful. <laughs> but what I want you to understand is I want you to own this truth that you are a son and daughter of the king. And you can step into that authority. You can step behind that counter. And you can pray with a, a confidence. You can pray with a power that comes from being a son of the God, of the creator of this universe. Do you get that? Do you understand that? Does that make sense? Are you still there? Did I lose you? Come on now, help me out. Okay, good, good. We got to walk in this truth. Secondly, we got to surrender. We got to get in neutral and surrender. I was coming back from a conference. I spoke at uh, Peoria, Illinois at a conference on prayer. And I was speaking away and um, got to the airport. It was one of those 
just ugly airport experiences. All of you have had them. This was the last plane out of Peoria, Illinois. And the plane, it was a smaller plane, probably had 100 people or so that it could fit. And there's probably 125 people trying to get on this plane. And uh, I knew my, if, if I got on, if I was lucky enough to get on, my luggage probably wouldn't get on. And I can remember I, can remember I was praying, God, please let me get on this plane. I don't want to spend the night in Peoria, Illinois. I don't have a car. I don't know how to get to a hotel. God, please help me get on this plane. And I, I'm just praying. Remember we talked about those prayers of anxiety? I'm praying those. And all of a sudden, it's like God slapped me across the face lovingly. And right in front of my eyes, as when I kind of woke up, there was a little girl. She's about two years old. She had a bow in her hair. And she was just playing and not a care in the world. I was watching her. She'd walk up to people and grin and play peekaboo and crazy stuff. And it's like God says, Paul, that's what it looks like. You see, she's not worried about anything because she trusts her dad. He's got it all. And she can just enroll. You know, that's what I want to say to you. You know, we spend way too much time trying to control stuff, fix stuff, manage stuff. And I'm calling you to own this truth that you're a son or daughter of the king. And I'm calling you to surrender to a God who loves you. And he can be trusted. And you can be like that little girl or that little boy that just walks beautifully, patiently, with a dad who cares about her. So what happens when a church gets a hold of this truth? You know, I was thinking about this. I was trying to think about how could I apply this message? How, how would this all come together? And here's what I know. Whenever you start coming to church, the first step is you start, you just show up in church, right? The next step, when you get really bold, what is it? You start parking at McDonald's, Right? riding a shuttle up here, okay? That's, that's the next big step. Then the third step is, yeah, maybe you start helping out, ushering or working with the kids or something. And those are all great steps. But there comes a point in, as you grow in Christ where you, you go, you know, I, I want to take another step. I want to I wanna advance the kingdom of God. I want to see God's kingdom move forward. And when you do that, you, you begin to pray differently. You begin to pray more in the authority you've been given as a child of God. Have you been to the car lots lately? Have you seen those tubes that have air in them and they flail around? You know, I, I'm done with flailing around like a car shop dummy. I want to stand on the, on the position and the authority I've been given in Christ. I want to pray in that authority, in that position. James says that he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. And when a church captures these thoughts, when they begin to understand that there's a kingdom at stake here, they begin to pray that God's kingdom comes down. They begin to pray for the lost like they've never prayed for the lost before. They begin to pray for missionaries and for their community. They begin to pray for kids and for school teachers and for their city and for marriages to be restored and, ad and addictions to be broken and lives to be transformed and chains to drop off and doors to be opened. It reminded me of the church in the book of Acts, chapter 4, and verse 32, where the scripture says, and after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God boldly. So here's my challenge. Church, I want to challenge you this morning. Some of you, this prayer thing is, is brand new to you. You haven't been around Pure Heart very long, and you're, you're just getting going in prayer. I, I want to challenge you to take your phone every day and set the timer for two minutes and just begin to talk to your dad. I promise you, you can't get it wrong. I promise you, your God will be thrilled to hear your voice. And I want to challenge you to pray in the authority of a son or daughter of the king. Now, there's a couple of other authorities I didn't talk about. Let me, let me do that real quickly. Another authority that you can pray in is as a husband. You know, I, I, Annie and I have been married 38 years. And there are times when I grab a hold of her head or grab a hold of her, her body and just say, God, I pray for this woman in the authority you've given me as her husband. God, I ask you to deal with this. I, I'm taking authority, Father, and stepping into that role you've given me. She doesn't have another husband. I'm the only one. And I pray in that authority for her well-being. And I've had some illness, and Dan mentioned that, and 
most of the nights I go to bed first and she'll come into the bedroom and I get all situated. She lays her hands on my head and she'll say, God, as this man's wife, I pray for his well-being, for his healing. It's a, it's a powerful thing. Husbands, if you're not praying for your wives in that authority, you're missing it. It's a powerful thing. Wives, if you're not praying for your husbands, look at what they're missing. And what about as, what about as parents? How many of you in here are parents today? Let me see your hands. How many of you are parents? Raise your hands. Yeah. And, and sometimes we have great times with our kids and times, sometimes we have trouble. I love to step into the authority of, of a parent with my kids and pray for them because I know them better than anybody else. And I could pray for them better than anybody else except for my wife. God, I pray for my son. Lord, you know what's going on. And as his father, I ask you, God, to move heaven and earth and to restore and to fix and to heal and to make new. Bring beauty from ashes. I love to pray in those authorities. And so my challenge this morning to you, or I guess it's afternoon now, is that you would begin to pray if you're not. If you've been praying a little longer, I want to encourage you to pray. If you've been praying five minutes a day, step it up to seven. But to begin to step into these authorities that you've been given. Consider joining the prayer ministry. Dan's heart has been for a long time that Pure Heart would be a house of prayer for the nations. And you know, I've been doing this now for four decades. And here's what I know. There's some things that happen. There's some flashes in the pan. But great ministry always is birth in prayer. And anytime revival happens, it's birth in prayer. And so my call to you this morning is that you as a church, you know, Dan can, Dan can have this heart and the elders can have this heart and the staff can have this heart, but it only happens when you the church members. Stick your hand up in the air and say, I'm in. I'm in. I'm, I'm going to pray for this church. I'm going to pray for this community. I'm going to see God do his work here. That's when God takes notice. And that's when things begin to shift in the heavens. And that's when incredible stuff begins to happen. God bless you all. I just want to take a moment as we end this weekend, this weekend services, and just to pray for Paul. I want to step out in what he has been talking about today. I have been given the privilege to have authority in his life as a lead pastor, which is such an interesting flip for us. He started off as my senior pastor, and now I <laughs> have the privilege of being his senior pastor. And, and uh, the, on the weekends, um, he'll come around and say, can I get you some water? Do you need anything? And I'm just like, this is so strange, you know? Um, but he's a servant. And he's a humble man. And I, I've been in, in ministry for almost 25 years now. I've seen all kinds of streams of Christianity when it comes to prayer. I, I've been involved in Hebraic roots type prayer. I, I've been involved in charismatic and Pentecostal streams of prayer. I've been involved in holiness and, and, and reflective and contemplative moments of prayer. But what I love about Paul is he has, first of all, a heart to see people who have never really truly prayed before get it. Can I get a yes on that? He wants them to get it. And secondly, there's just such humility. Paul reminds me of a man who's willing to pick up his lunchbox every day and go do the work of prayer. And I'm telling you, the next revival is not going to come from some flashy ministry. Mm -hmm. The next revival for our country is going to come from men and women who are willing to pick up their lunchbox and Amen. do the work of prayer. Amen. Can I get a yes one more time Amen. in this house? Amen. That's where revival is going to come. And so will you join me in prayer? Would you reach your hands out towards Paul? Father God, I come as your son Amen. and also in the authority that you've given me as a senior pastor in yes, Paul's Lord. life. Yes, Lord. And Lord, I'm asking that the enemy's attacks, the enemy's harassment on Paul's life physically will be stopped in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. That you will strengthen his body, you will strengthen his mind, you'll give him hope and encouragement, yes, that you will give back all that the enemy has tried to take in from him and the time and the, of healing and chemotherapy and all the treatments he's had to been through over the years, God. Pay him back, repay him, God. Refresh him and bless him. Pray for strength in his relationship with Annie. Pray for him as a father and as a grandfather. Thank you for bringing him to Pure Heart. Thank you for the strategies that you're giving him for yes. prayer, not only at Pure Heart, but around this city that's yes. going to flow out into this country and to the world. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Come on, give Paul a big hand today. I love you, buddy. Love you too. The other thing I wanted to share with you, just being extra real, is that for me, what hit me this weekend was praying in the authority as a husband. And um, I pray for my wife, Nicole. We, we pray for each other. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I don't pray for my wife. But what the Lord what struck my heart with this weekend is that my mom has an incredible gift of intercession. 
She's just a prayer warrior. Anybody know my mom, Nancy? Anybody know? If you know Nancy, she is a prayer warrior. And my father's a humble prayer warrior as well. But there's times in our lives when I've said to Nicole, maybe, maybe we should get my mom, she can pray for you, which is great. But the Holy Spirit reminded me, listen, Dan, don't lean on your mother's prayers alone. I've given you authority as a husband to stand in the gap for your wife when she is struggling. And so how many husbands do we have in the room? Raise your hands. I just want to challenge you guys to pray for your wives and to stand in that authority that God has given you. Can I get an amen from the men in the room today? Come on, you guys. Bow your heads with me for just a moment. I'm so looking forward to next week and I'm looking forward to diving back into teaching and I have so much stuff burning in my heart, especially in this area of communication among family. There's such a breakdown among families when it comes to communication. A majority of our problems come from not being able to say what we mean and mean what we say. We just, we, we're hurt by one another. And I believe that on Mother's Day weekend, the Spirit of God is going to begin to bring healing into our families. Relationships between dads and their boys and dads and their daughters and moms and their kids and grandparents. There's going to be healing. Even, even healing in relationships with maybe parents who are older now. And um, there's just been that brokenness from your childhood. And God can begin to bring healing in those relationships. I'm looking forward to it. Before we get ready for next weekend, I want to give you the opportunity who are sitting here today and listening online to move from being just God's creation to his very own child. I know in our world we say all the time, we're all children of God. No, we're all created by God. We're all made in God's image. But in John's gospel, John chapter 1 and verse 12, he makes it very, very clear. To all who believed in Jesus, to all who received him, he gave them the right to become children of God. And your first step into stepping into the authority as a child of God is by receiving what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you. That love, that forgiveness, that hope, that power. That's where it starts. So if you're listening online today, maybe for the first time in your life, or maybe today you want to rededicate your life to Christ, and you're ready to make that decision, there's a little button on, that, on the screen right now that says, today I put my trust in Jesus. If you're ready to make that, that step, click that button today. And in just a moment, you're going to join us in prayer. For the rest of us sitting here in this room today, if you're ready to make that step, to go from being just God's creation to his very own child, it begins by saying yes to Jesus. So with your heads bowed today, if you're in that place where you're ready to make that decision, maybe for the first time in your life, greatest decision you'll ever make, or maybe today you want to rededicate your life to Christ. Years ago, you asked Christ into your life, you received his love and forgiveness, but man, if we could be real, you've been doing your own thing and going your own way, and here you are today, not by chance. No, Jesus wanted a moment to slow you down long enough and say, hey, Come home to me. I love you. I want you to let go of all that pain. And so if that's you today for the first time, or today's rededication of your life to Christ, in this room what we do is we raise our hand high. If you're ready to make that decision, then just boldly, without hesitation, just raise your hand up and say, that's me today. Just raise them all across the room. Yeah, absolutely. Keep raising them. Anyone? Yes, yes, and yes. Fantastic. Anybody over here on this side? I need Christ today. Anybody else? Oh, yes. Fantastic. All of you with your hands raised, go ahead and put them down right now and pray this in your heart. God hears you. Lord Jesus, right now in this moment, I commit my life to you. I trust you with my life. Oh, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. You know what it is, and I give it to you right now. Thank you. Just say thank you. Thank you for your forgiveness and for never giving up on me. I trust you with my life. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your hope. In Jesus' name. And everyone said... Give God a huge hand today. Isn't that awesome? That is fantastic. I love it.